Welcome to the Barrel Room Chronicles. I'm Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward, former bartender, and all-around whiskey aficionado. I travel the world to explore whiskey from every avenue. For the last 20 years, I've been helping others tell their stories through television, film, and other media. But now, I'm taking my love for whiskey and my experience in the entertainment industry to uncover the fascinating stories of the water of life. So kick off your shoes, pour yourself a dram, and join me for this episode of Barrel Room Chronicles. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It is five o'clock somewhere and you've tuned in to episode two of BRC. Today in our Tales from the Still segment, I speak with Irish doctoral student Fanon O'Connor about his research on Irish ghost whiskeys. I will also be speaking with Jonathan Pogash, a.k.a. the cocktail guru, about his entrepreneurial spirit in Tavern Talks. But first... More on Irish whiskey's history in this week's Dram Diaries. Stay with us. In our last episode, we learned how Irish whiskey went from the most popular spirit in the world at the start of the 20th century to practically extinct in just a matter of decades. What we didn't cover was how or with what the whiskey was made. Traditional Irish whiskies were made in copper pot stills rather than column stills, which didn't even come into use for distillation until the early 1800s. The Irish style whiskey, formerly known as pure pot still, emerged as a means of avoiding a tax introduced on malted barley in 1785. Single pot still, as it's known today, refers to a mixed mash of malted and unmalted barley distilled in a copper pot still. With the resurgence of Irish whiskey, the use of copper pot stills and the pure pot still style of whiskey has been making a tremendous comeback. We know that today's Irish whiskey makers are turning to their roots for the process of making whiskey. But what about the mash bill? Were Irish whiskey makers only putting out single pot still expressions, or did the ancestors of Irish whiskey use other grain recipes that have long been forgotten? That is one of the questions asked by today's guest, Fanon O'Connor. O'Connor has been researching various Irish whiskey mash bills in use between 1760 and 1970 by searching through hidden archives scattered across the Emerald Isle. Up next, I speak with Fanon about his unusual whiskey journey and his findings while writing his thesis on Irish whiskeys of the past. On today's show, we have Fanon O'Connor, who's doing a PhD in ghost whiskey. Actually, it's historical whiskey, but I think I like the ghost whiskey term. So Fanon, you've got a very interesting whiskey journey, which I would love to hear about. So tell me when you were a wee little lad, what did you expect your your life to be? What did you think you'd be doing? And did you ever think that you would be researching historical whiskeys? I didn't know what modern whiskey was until I was 18. So, you know, there was the wee little lad had had very, very little idea of what was in store. But no, I mean, when I first struck out as an 18 year old, I was, I was pretty dead certain I was going to be an academic. And my original background was in uh, medieval history and medieval literature, and a little bit of comparative lit. And whiskey kind of happened by accident. Uh, I was I was into whiskey very quickly from the age of eighteen, um, just through again a series of accidents, um, probably a little bit before the age of eighteen. But you know we won't we won't dwell too too uh, too long on the roots on the oh, deep hey, roots. In America, in America, eighteen is very early. So oh you know, no, I know. Yeah, I found that out. I went. I did my undergrad in America and and learned that very quickly. And yeah, well, don't worry. There were there were ways around. <laughs> The, but yeah, it, it it happened very fast and very soon. And then through a series of awkward circumstances, it it, it became uh, my first my job, and then bizarrely enough, my my research interest as well. And um, so I was I was going to college in California, and I met the West Coast Diageo Master of Whiskey. Now they had these Masters of Whiskey brand positions scattered around. So the guy named Steve Beale, and I met him in a, an Irish pub in Berkeley. And he said, look, do you want a, do you want a job? Um, and I think I had the right name and the right accent. Um, 
well, actually the wrong accent, but uh, wrong part of Ireland, but they owned Bushmills at the, at the time. And anyway, I started working there. And, you know, once I was part of the kind of Diageo fold, I was allowed to drink a lot of stuff that I couldn't afford as a student. Um, I started going to whiskey fairs on, on behalf of, so I would do Bushmills and then assist Steve as a kind of a lackey setting up the, the classic malts lineup, you know, Talisker, et cetera, while he kind of worked the room. And, uh, and then, you know, I'd be given a, a dinner break where I could go around and drink everybody else's stuff as if I was at, you know, paying to be at these places. And, you know, I think as, as nice. you probably know yourself on the far side of the trade veil, it's, it's very easy to, there's a lot of camaraderie about showing people in other companies what you're doing, you know. And so I was, I was doing that and I started working for a cocktail bar in San Francisco owned by an Irish fellow. Um, it's the place called Bourbon and Branch. But the owner is from from Kerry, from Honest Skull originally. So I had access to a whole that shelf. That is a great place. That is a great place for him to be from. Kerry, yes, of course. Kerry, so yes. yes. <laughs> of course, yeah. A lovely, lovely part of Ireland. And so I was doing that with one hand, doing the other with the other. And then I started teaching a... So the college had this, this system called DECALS, Democratic Education CAL, where a student could teach a one unit class uh, on an odd topic if they could get a professor to sponsor them. And, you know, you had to submit a syllabus and you had to, you know, they'd come in and check on you and so forth. And we got the Celtic languages department, so the professor named um, Dr. Melia, and he, he sponsored history and appreciation of whiskey, where myself and a, and a Scottish mate of mine taught you know, history of whiskey. And of course, what we would do because of the complicated drinking age in, in the US was we would just do the history and the theory and the production and all that stuff in class. And then we'd go for a drink afterwards and you're not required to be there for the, the tasting, but, you know, you buy your own alcohol however you can at whatever age point you are. And this was at Berkeley? Yeah. I should have been going to Berkeley instead of San Francisco. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know if it lasted much longer than the two of us, but in our prime, we were the second most popular student taught class on campus after female sexuality. So we, we, we did have a lot of fun. And of course, when you're, I was doing that for four semesters and when you're required to stand up in front of people, you know, obviously you're, you're under a bit of pressure to kind of learn your shit. And so I started reading more about fermentation times and, and this kind of stuff. And then I graduated, came back to Dublin for uh, my master's and I was still doing again, kind of comparative historical lit. And uh, I started writing a book about a particular type of whiskey, you know, what's now being called single pot still, uh, Irish single pot still, what used to be called Irish pure pot still. And when I started, it was kind of a dying style. And now it's all over the place, you know, and that happened almost while I was, so it took three years to write. So I, I was doing it while I was doing my master's. And then put the academia on hold and thought, well, okay, I'll finish the whiskey book. And then when the whiskey book came out, suddenly Ireland had gone from having like four distilleries to, you know, well, the current headcount is 39. And um, then I, you know, all the stuff I've been saying free for years on bar stools, annoying people, suddenly I started getting paid to say this stuff. And, um, you know, it was, it was this kind of bizarre. Love it. And so, yeah, I, I, I became a, like accidentally became a whiskey writer. People started using these these words, you know, and, and I was you know, kind of startled. But then um, eventually on the back of the book, I managed to get a, a grant, um, a funding grant for a, for a PhD on the history of Irish mash bills, of lost mash bills. And of course, the, the defining attribute of Irish pot still, other than the use of the pot still, the Irishness of the process is the use of raw barley along with the malt. But in when I was doing the research for the book, I was finding that the original definition was much closer to what you see in bourbon or rye, where it's, you know, mostly malt and raw barley, but other stuff as well. And this kind of flexibility, this more elastic uh, heritage that had died off. And anyway, the current project is about looking through old distilleries, at what, what's in, in, in which distilleries it does survive their notebooks. And for the rest of it, government excise reports, legislation, you know, periphery industry, pub reports, whatever, and trying to resuscitate this more complex legacy where you had, yeah, malt and raw barley, but you also had huge heaps of oats for starters, and then to a smaller degree, wheat and rye, um, and trying to kind of reconstruct that. 
And so that's been ongoing for about three years now. And uh, next year is the, the crunch time. And last year, at the end of last year, or end of 2020, start of 2021, kind of December, January, uh, Boan Distillery teamed up with, with the thesis and redistilled a series of these mash bills. And I can say this all publicly now. I know when we first spoke, it was all very hush because they were submitted to a blind panel. No, it's hush, hush. Yeah, 26 blenders and distillers, mostly Irish, but also some Scots, um, and a few a few critics here and there um, to kind of spice up the gene pool. And it had to be blind, so everything had to be done, you know, secretly. So there were 10 mash bills and two two controls on the table. Um, and anyway, we, we subject them to an arduous all-day affair. I think a lot of them were very enthusiastic and then didn't realize how boring the whole thing would be, you know, where you're you're literally given sheets of zero to three you know because you're taking something highly subjective and trying to make it as objective as you can so 26 gives us a good a good robust panel and then you take like a note like you say say you know uh vanilla and you rank each sample they're cut down to 30 percent, and you have to nose zero to three zero being not present three being extremely present and going down and then again with another trait and then again with another trait and trying to 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 come up with something out of this. And there was a lot of love and goodwill from the trade. They all did it voluntarily. And we had everyone from, you know, Laura Hemi, who's Diageo, to Brendan Carty, who distills in the tiny shed up in the mountains. You know, there was there was a huge kind of cross support, you know, and and that was that meant a lot to me to have that kind of reaction. And then the results as they come out will be available to the industry, you know, and 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 the idea is that everyone in that room goes home and kind of not only recreates this stuff but more more properly kind of plays with what they've found from the past and makes something new out of it and and what can we what can we discern because it wasn't just the mash bills that died off it was the kind of logic of how to manipulate you know how many people are alive who even remember you know irish whiskey stopped having oats in it in the 70s now there's some bottles from the 70s that people drink that have oats in them but you know uh how much of that was lost and trying to recuperate the logic of what happens when you play with oats going up or raw barley going down or up or both, go, you know, or if you take the oats out and put wheat, whatever, you know, and um, some of that survives in American whiskey, obviously, uh, wheat and rye, but in a kind of a bourbon and rye whiskey context, but putting that stuff with malt and raw barley and raw barley in particular, uh, which survives as this kind of uniquely Irish flavor profile uh, was, was kind of a, uh, you know, you're, you're stepping into new terrain that's also, you know, the ruins of the old industry. So it was a, a lot of fun, you know, and, and still is, you know. Yeah, I really wanted to be on your panel, but, you know, COVID. Travel. I know. Yeah, we couldn't have, unfortunately, <laughs> we originally hoped to have Americans in as well, but then COVID just <laughs> sliced that, you know. Yeah. Um, we yeah. actually had to, we had to, we had to split the panel. We had to do it twice, once in Belfast and once in Dublin, um, because at the real height of COVID, um, it was hard to get there was a, a quarantine the from, the UK, from the uk into ireland yeah so people could go to belfast from the uk and it's it's a it's a very odd situation northern ireland has but essentially you could cross the border north south yep. no problem but if you were flying from britain you had to quarantine but if you're flying from britain to belfast you're still in the uk so you don't have so there was this perfect little spot in belfast where we could get everyone and then those who couldn't make belfast we did it we repeated it in in dublin Oh. But and how many yeah, days apart? It, how many days apart were those? Not that long, like a week or two, you know. And we didn't tell the Belfast crew what was what was in them. For that reason, I, I, I was heartbroken. We couldn't tell them uh, what was what was in the glasses because we had to keep it silent for for the the next crowd down the line. So, what, did you tell them after the Dublin crew came in, and, or they yeah. still don't know? Everybody, every it's public right. knowledge now. Yeah, everybody, everybody knows what's in them. Well, everyone who who wants to know. Right. So you touched on something when you were talking about writing your book, how they basically changed the, the the term for the pot still. So what is the reason, or do you know, why they stopped calling it pure and changed it? Yeah, I mean, there's a story about the U.S. having qualms with the term pure when it's not pure alcohol. Um, but also it seemed very convenient. You know, single pot still sounds like single malt. And I, I have a suspicion. I mean, you know, single malt is an invented term from, from the 60s. You know, before then, you never hear anything called, it's called pure malt or Highland whiskey or Highland style or unblended whiskey or self whiskey is a very popular one. 
And essentially, William Grant for Glenfiddich came up with single malt. And then in the 70s, other distilleries started imitating. And then by the 80s, single malt became the, the, the root of the phenomenon that is now. Now, the, the whiskey, single malt as a liquid concept has been around for, for centuries. But, you know, the term single malt is quite new. And it created a space in which the unblended pure malt of a single distillery could could thrive. And I think the hope with single pot still, and it, it's such an odd one because historically the name Irish pot still is very entrenched. And, you know, when you look, there are single malts in Ireland and there's a lot of them now, but when you look historically, they were really mostly just in, in Ulster, in the north of Ireland. Um, the part closest to Scotland, Bushmills, Coleraine, these places. Um, and the, you know, when, when Alfred Barnard made his infamous tour of the Britain and Ireland of distilleries, you know, there were 28 distilleries in Ireland, two of them made single malt, a few column stills, and then the rest was all Irish pot still. And, the, you know, again, it was in contrast to Scottish pot still in people's minds. And so the idea was that the Irish were running mixed mashes right. through, these, through these pots. And again, mixed mashes around the principle of malt, raw barley, oats, wheat, and rye. What do you think the reason is that they stopped using oats? Because I think that would be a very interesting flavor profile to keep homogenization the industry fell apart you know it went from having 28 distilleries to having two and you know a lot of these distilleries took their mash bills to the grave you know and you you end up with you know by the by the 1950s there's really two mash bills on the go other than sing, if you unless you count single malt as a mash bill um but two mash bills on the go coming out of pots and then it becomes one and then that mash bill gets simpler and simpler and then it, it it kind of homogenizes to 60% raw barley, 40% malt, which is what, what Middleton make, you know, and uh, I don't mean to, you know, that, that mash bill was one of the controls and it did just fine. You know, it was extremely fruity in comparison to the adjuncted ones, you know, which tend to be more cereally tasting. So it's, it's not just, you know, the easiest access point is there's more to it than that, but certainly what caused mash bills to homogenize is, is very closely tied in the 20th century to a collapse and B corporate homogenization, you know, and 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 that is that is quite trackable. But again, you look back, like the old mash bill for for Jemison uh, would have been back when Jemison was a pot still whiskey would have been about you know thirty to forty percent malt, um, about forty percent raw barley, about fifteen to twenty percent oats, about five percent wheat, and about one percent rye. Very very different drink to what right. you know we would think of now. Um, and of course, the current one is is a blend, but even the pot still component of that is is nothing like these older whiskeys. So that was part of the attraction where for the book, I was drinking samples of stuff from the 50s and 60s. And it was, it was there. And I'd had stuff from, you know, said like, you know, 1910 for, for the, for some of the dead that died early on, like uh, Paris is out in Galway. And they were, I was I was aware that they were different drinks and I was aware that they had oats in them and that there was some talk of wheat and rye, but I just didn't know what, you know, these were spoken of in almost hushed terms. If you, if you, if you have, you know, old Middleton distillery, it's got oats in it. Nobody, nobody knew, you know, and, um, and trying to, to make that available and trying to look at that sincerely. I mean, so what I'm drinking now, this is a decanted because the cork was fucked. Um, the uh, bottle of of Lox Distillery, which closed in 1955, um, or around oh, wow. 55, um, and this would have been about 40 percent malt, 40 percent barley, raw barley, uh, and 15 percent oats, about five percent wheat. And so, you know, you, you'd be knocking this stuff around, and they have these strange. It smells like contemporary Irish pot still. It smells like red breast, but it doesn't. At the same time, you know, it's, it smells. It has this kind of linseed oily thing going on. It's very herbaceous. It's 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 strange stuff, you know. And so, where did you find this bottle? These and came how, up. How many and, years old is it? It's it's just a classic seven year old, but from that from that time, uh, somebody in Ireland found a, a, basically a crate of them and uh, sold them off. And uh, a mate of mine bought two, and then told me, "Oh, this happened last week," and I bought one because I thought you'd buy it. And uh, and then I owed him money. You know, as as as, as it happens. Um, but they went. They did. We went for pennies in comparison to what they'd probably get at auction. Um, 
And um, wow. the but again, they they do, and you get this stuff still poured. There's a lot, you know, and it's it's funny. That was something that that fed the book, which was that the perception of Irish whiskey abroad, and a, a big part of the marketing of Irish whiskey was oddly out of step with a lot of the people I knew and a lot of the, in Ireland and why they drank whiskey. And, you know, I think Irish whiskey, especially in America, has presented itself as a kind of a smoother alternative to scotch. You, know, you hear terms like light, accessible, friendly, whatever. And then when you talk to the like retirees that go to whiskey societies in Ireland, all they want to talk about is oil, you know, oil and viscosity and density and ginger. And these are the buzzwords, you know, yeah. and they talk about how heavy a whiskey is. And raw barley is very, very oily. And then when the more about the old ones where they're even thicker still. And so even when I was with Diageo, that always struck me, that strange contrast between the marketing of Irish blended whiskey specifically, and especially with what's now been called single pot still, that love for kind of resinous flavors, you know, back of the shed, you know, you hear all these like horrific terms like, you know, old lino, back of the shed, wood shop, resin, engine grease. And people say them with, you know, watering eyes about, you know, how much they adore this stuff. And it, it was very, very thick stuff. And, and it has this weird, again, like gingery kind of crackle. And that, for a lot of them, was was the real Irish whiskey, even though it made up a tiny fraction of what was actually commercially available as Irish whiskey. And I definitely would have fallen into that camp right. of the kind of traditionalist, you know, last of a dying breed whiskeys. And that's what I was, you know, Redbreast and, and Greenspot were were, um, were the last breath of that. But then when you really dug into the well, you started getting like, well, okay, Powers in the 50s had 20% oats in it, you know, uh, and these these very different, much heavier drinks, even, and again, you know, when they were direct fired, uh, they, they tended to have a, a kind of a, a more robust flavor as well. So all of these bits of nostalgia or curiosity were, were out there. And then the thesis was an attempt to, as best as I could, you know, using, like I was happy enough to know how to work with an archive, you know, uh, go back through what was there and try and build some sort of gift back to the back to the industry and you know make this really easily accessible now it's written in like very dry footnoted style it's you know it's like eating sand to read and even i think that i can't imagine what anyone else thinks but the uh, to at least have it out there and, and certainly i, I hope the, your book doesn't i hope your book doesn't read like that <laughs> yeah well the book unfortunately the book was reprinted in this just tiny you know, King James Bible font um, that's really difficult to read. There's an older edition oh of goodness. a coffee table looking book. Uh, and I mean, on the internet, you can find anything you want. So if you find a used copy of the 2015 one, it's it's bigger, but it's also far more legible. And the title um, again of the book is? The book was called A Glass Apart. Um, and at that point, it was possible. That came out in 2015. The original one, the, the, the mini one came out in 2017. Um, but they're both they're both the same book, just different different size, and one is infinitely more legible. But when when that came out, it was possible to just write about all Irish pot still whiskey there was, every single cask, you know, whatever, and and then historical bottles from before. Now that's exploded. You have this huge array of distilleries, and it's going, it's growing faster and faster and faster. And then we're seeing now, you know, I think the the renaissance of Irish whiskey hasn't happened yet it's going to happen within the next five years as all these distilleries start having you know five to ten year old product five to twelve year old product in some cases you know and and seeing that evolve and seeing these new flavors come out and i think mash bills are a very slow part of distilling because you know you, you're going in at the root it's not like finishing something the hope is that this is this is sowing seeds for the long you know the long renaissance the long uh rebirth of 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 not just the category as a business, but the kind of, you know, culinary soul of, of Irish whiskey, you know, and, and what it was and what it can be out of the, out of the kind of plasma of, of that inheritance. So that's the next step is not just recreating them, but like seeing what people do with the recreations, you know, what happens if you peak these mushrooms, what happens, whatever, if you double distill versus triple distill, you know, there's endless possibilities, but that's not my job. You know, my job is just to make the history there and, and right. trim off the bullshit and, you know, <laughs> Um, so on the tasting that you did, did you have a distillery make all these mash bills for you? And then that's what they were tasting? Yeah. So it would have been Boan Distillery up in Drogheda. 
and they were they were enormously accommodating because for it to be scientifically valid, it had to be shared in all respects productionally except mash bill. So same flow rate, same fermentation time, same yeast, same cut points, same everything. We had to redistill separately so that the recycled faints weren't contaminating the next batch. You know, everything had to be clinically done to make sure that you know the differences weren't coming from distillation regimen or you know any any other factor that we could control. The control, as in the scientific control, was uh, 50 50 malt, raw barley, which is just you know, straight down the middle, no adjuncts. And then the second control right. was 60 40, which is the commercially prevalent one. That's what, say, like red breast is. And, and then everything is, is based on that framework. And they were triple distilled, you know, because now if we were just looking at compounds, we'd want to double distill because then we get even more of everything and it'd be more distinct. But even at triple distillation, they were, they were amazingly different to each other. It was startling. And we had to keep it triple because A, those are the controls. And B, you know, if you're looking at, say, like the old Dublin distilleries, they would have been triple distilled in large bulbous pots, you know, the ancestors to, to Middleton. So again, it, they had to, we couldn't, we couldn't muck about with, with other stuff, you know, they had to be in one place. And Boan was perfect because they had a setup where they had large bulbous stills a la Middleton or Tullamore or any of the, the kind of industry standards. And they were, you know, automated enough to be precise but then creative enough and small enough to be willing to take time off and do this you know and michael walsh the distiller was was you know he's a good friend of mine so saw eye to eye immediately and and he very much fell in love with the project and what could be done and we would we had a great time you know when they were coming off we expected to be faced with all kinds of problems you know there was all this talk about oats creating a paste or porridge or gumming up the works and and, and all this stuff and as long as we handled that beforehand and made sure it was constant that handling you know like beta glucan stands even when we didn't need them you know everything was exactly the same uh we were we were fine so we spent a month you know we'd have these logs where i'd talk to them about what was happening during the day and they ended up just being kind of dramming sessions you know because nothing was going wrong so we'd be having a merry time talking about what went right you know so it was a really it became a lot of fun you know were those uh, video sessions or just notes? No, type? just I, I had recording equipment, by which I mean my phone, and audio recordings, keeping a log. And the log, the, okay. the log was supposed to be recording the um, the technical tribulations that they face, and and they didn't really happen. I remember the anxiety. There was one match that was thirty percent oats. That was the highest oat content, and there was there was a lot of worry. You know, the wow. engineering firm that outfitted them, you know came out point blank saying like the warranty is null and void for this you know we're not taking any responsibility <laughs> i was a great you know and i was thinking oh fuck am i gonna break the kit you know the, but anyway nothing went wrong you know? and, and um so the log is just me and michael propped up saying like comparing things we, we must have compared everything you know what happens when you have 15 percent oats five percent rye versus 15 percent oats versus 5% wheat versus 20% oats, you know, and, and changing variables. But yeah, an absolute joy. And they were they were enormously accommodating, you know, because it's not easy, of course, for a distillery to to take that risk. And then I, I also asked that they would sell the cast off um, to private, you know, punters, pubs, societies, people. Um, because when we're yeah. inviting all these other distillers in, I wanted to make it clear that Boan weren't building a brand around this, that it is, they'll obviously get all the credit they deserve for for having made it but it, it's gone back into the bloodstream in a very public way um and and then the information so is what is available in trade what is the ultimate goal of the thesis like when you're all done with it and it's published and it's ready to go are you going to try to pass it out to various distillers and say hey make these the ultimate goal of the thesis is to turn me into doctor me everything else is you know on periphery <laughs> Pure vanity is what's, is what's motivating the thesis. But when, when that's aside, yeah, the hope is, is to get it out there, is to, is to help reorient the imagination of Irish whiskey away from, even what's in the thesis, away from the past, or has often happened, the false past, and to at least make it clear what was in the past, but then to encourage people to manipulate that, to you know not just replicate the past, but take the past as culinary heritage and and muck about with it reinterpret it respin it you know do what they want with it so the hope is that this is just the 
the, the, the genesis, you know, I don't want Irish whiskey to be what Irish whiskey was in 1915, but let alone what it was in 1815. But to be aware of that in a severe sense and to treat it seriously as culinary culture, as liquid inheritance, as something more than the easy branding that Irish whiskey and Irish anything can fall into. You know, Ireland has a right. term here, paddywhackery. And paddywhackery is like us prostituting the country with leprechaun shite. And it, it, it you know, makes a lot of Irish people cringe. But you see it in, in a lot of like, export-oriented stuff. And to kind of move it away from that into this more sincere food and drinks heritage, uh, distiller's heritage. And of course, you, you know, I don't, I'm not naive. You know, a lot of these are controlled by huge multinationals. And, you know, there's a lot more forces at play. And it is an industry, first and foremost. It is not a restaurant. You know, there's a lot more there. But in any sense, as available to anyone across the craft to, to large distilling operations, I have had sincere talks with, with loads of them about what they'd like to do. And we, you know, even after um, the panels, we, you know, all went to the pub and had the chats, as it were. And there was a lot of questions, especially after the second panel, where we could be a bit more open mouthed about what was going on, what people wanted to do with any of this. And, and when college comes back on stream, the lab group over in, in so the, the, there's a, a paper within the thing. So the, the, the chemical analysis is happening over at Harriet Watt in, in Edinburgh. And uh, they'll be, Coming back, they've already started sending me little strains of grass and this and that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be able to see, you know, is there a compound in oats that makes it taste more linseedy? You know, whatever, you know, uh, how do we, how do we extrapolate from, from the sensory using, using the chemical? And that's way out of my hands because that's not my field at all. So that's I'm, not I'm your, right. incredibly lucky to have them involved and, and interested. Do you think this this thesis experience will bring out another book for the public that would be a little bit easier read than your thesis? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the, the, the other book is already in the way or on the way. And when the thesis is finished, it'll the, the energy will definitely transfer over to the other one. So when you did the, the mash bill tastings yourself, did you have a favorite or is there one that really stood out as way different than you would have expected it to be? You know, more or less gelled with, 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 what Michael and I have been saying to each other. So, you know, no huge surprises, some surprises internally, kind of certain things were a bit fruitier than we thought, but you know, nothing, nothing major. And like, definitely the trends are all there. You know, the ones we thought were vanilla, are vanilla, you know, so forth. Um, so that was more than any particular mass, which is a huge relief. So before you took on this project, what was your favorite type of whiskey? Was it Irish whiskey from the get-go or did you like no, Scotch or bourbon? Irish whiskey. It would have been... Pot, Irish pot still, single pot still specifically. But I, I think my, my three loves really uh, would have been like Isla Scotch, very heavily peated malt whiskey, American rye, kind of like Monongahela style, you know, rye, high rye rye and okay. Irish pot still, uh, which are all very, very different to each other, but all, again, unapologetic oh, yeah. about what they are, you know, and, and that would definitely be the, the favorite confident distillate led whiskey, you know. So... After you finish the thesis and the second book, what do you plan to do as Dr. O'Connor? I, you know, I'd just keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I would love to just keep writing and, about and whiskey. And drinking whiskey. And drinking whiskey and writing, you know, if, if necessary, in an academic context as well. I'm happy in that field, writing about, like, the social position of alcohol, whatever. You know, there's, there's, there's space there. Well, soon to be Dr. O'Connor, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today and imparting all your knowledge. And I hope that you keep us uh, up to date on when your thesis is finished and when it is published and when your new book comes out, because we would love to support that, put it up on the website and be able to follow your research because I find it fascinating. And when I saw the article in the magazine about a ghost whiskey PhD, I said, oh, I got to get this guy because this is fascinating. So thank you so much for being on today. No problem. Pleasure. Absolutely. Honor. Don't touch that device. We'll be right back with Tavern Talk. If you like what you've seen on BRC, you'll love what's coming soon in the Barrel Room Parlor. As a member, you'll have exclusive access to various spin-off series, including The Cutting Room Floor and the Telly Award-winning series Kindred Spirits. To create your membership, visit www.barrelroomchronicles.com and click on Become a Member. Once you have chosen your membership level, 
you'll be able to enjoy all the extra content it has to offer. You'll even be able to participate with the show by commenting on videos and other posts. Don't wait. Sign up today for exclusive content in the Barrel Room Parlor. Hey, Jonathan. Nice to have you here on the Barrel Room Chronicles. How are you today? Hey, this is very exciting. Uh, I'm doing well, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. Good, good, good. Well, we are here at the Tavern Talk section of our show, and I wanted to talk to you about the Cocktail Guru, this business that you have started. I know that I know pretty much about it uh, based on your podcast, the Pop Cocktail Guru podcast that you host with your father, Jeffrey, which is fantastic. So those that listen- Thanks, for the, pl- there, thanks who, for the plug. Yes, who haven't listened, they, they should. But yes, for those of you who have not listened to the C- Cocktail Guru podcast, it's quite fun. It's got a lot of celebrity beverage and chef type folks. So you should totally check that out. But when you're not doing your podcast, the Cocktail Guru is a company you started. Now tell me, all about it because I know you started off as an actor and then started doing bartending uh, during that time. But now you've got like this enterprise. So tell me about that. Yeah, I could try to tell you all about it. I don't know how much time we have, but um, just the, in a nutshell, yes, I moved to New York city to become an actor. And of course I started bartending on the side to actually make money. Um, And it was kind of from that, that I started falling in love with hospitality and the industry and mixing cocktails. Of course, Acting was kind of the first, the first love, but soon cocktails and and spreading the word took over, and I created this little side hustle while while I was bartending full time called the Cocktail Guru in two thousand six, uh, and then it uh, it grew and grew until well one day you know my my then fiance now wife Megan we decided to move in together, and it was at that point that we decided that I should scale back on bartending and coming home at five in the morning and try to pursue this consulting career uh, and hospitality full time. And I did, and I took the plunge and I gained some amazing clients in New York City, some really great hospitality um, organizations, restaurants and bars hired me to, started hiring me to create their cocktail menus and train their staff. And I was doing all these events for brands. I was doing TV segments. I started doing cocktail TV segments from morning television, like the Today Show. Um, and, you know, I, Very I was nice. like, yeah. And I thought, well, it, this is interesting. I'm kind of putting a little bit of acting and improv skills to work here, uh, doing that. And and then we moved, we moved out of New York to Massachusetts, where we are now. And I expanded up here. And then I eventually expanded nationally. And I now I have a team of cocktail gurus across the country that do various jobs. They, they do, a, we have a pretty big corporate team building mixology class business, uh, which we pivoted and did virtually um, and have been doing virtually for a, almost two years, I guess. Yeah. Nice. Almost yeah, two years. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> almost two years now. And, and we have, we do those in person now again. Um, and then we help bars and restaurants open up and do all kinds of events, fun events, trade events, uh, consumer events, uh, you name it. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. That's awesome. Um, so if somebody wanted to hire you, where would they go? What would they do? Well, they could uh, they could go right to the website, thecocktailguru.com. Uh, we have all the information you need, our background, bios, what we do, how to get in touch with us. Um, and, you know, we would, we would take it from there. Fantastic. Um, so what kind of, I mean, how many, all together now that you're national, about how many gurus do you think you have out there? We have about... 10 or so that that we keep working pretty steadily they're all full-time bartenders as well or bar managers or bar owners so actually one thing during the pandemic when everything stopped we were able to keep these bartenders working uh, which was kind of a big deal and and i'm very thankful for that um but we also you know not only do we have these 10 cocktail gurus across the country that are steady steady workers for us we also have um dozens of others that we've worked with in the past where it enables us to do events pretty much anywhere across the country. Like for example, a couple of weeks ago, we did a holiday party in Oklahoma city. Um, nice. And we, we just did a team building event, team building holiday party in Chicago and Beverly Hills this past week. And it, it's literally all over. So if anyone has anything anywhere, <laughs> we can get someone who is, who has been trained by me uh, and my team to, to, you know, provide a, a worthwhile experience. That's fantastic. Um, so did you find this job fulfilling for you uh, now that you've pivoted away from, from acting? Is this, is this, do you feel good about this choice? Yeah. 
<laughs> Thanks, Carrie. I I do feel I I do feel good. I'm kind of in it right now. Um, if I didn't feel good, it, I would definitely be in trouble. Um, but I do feel good. And what I like is that it is ever changing, not only because of um a a 20 month pandemic, but also the industry itself just is is morphing into different aspects. You know, right now it's like um no alcohol, canned cocktails, um some very small markets in in the midwest and in the west that that are wanting to get in, get into craft cocktails and and we're always we've always been trying to to figure out what's next and and I've been I've definitely been a hustler you know and and I'm I'm of the mentality that it's it's never things are never good enough you know not in a bad way but in right. in, a, in a way like I'm looking towards what I can do next but but yeah, you know, I'm always I'm always seeing seeing what's happening next and trying to figure things out. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on the company. I think it's a fantastic um, enterprise, and I'm so glad that I get to work with you on a daily basis on your podcast. <laughs> and um, I'm glad you were able to come and be on my podcast. Thank you again, and congratulations on your podcast. For show notes on today's episode, please visit www.barrelroomchronicles.com. If you like what you heard, please rate and subscribe to the podcast. If you really liked it and you want to show your support, buy us a whiskey through our Kofi site. If you work in the whiskey industry or run a whiskey bar or club and you'd like to be featured on Barrel Room Chronicles, register to be a guest through our website. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, Salangeva. Barrel Room Chronicles is a production of First Real Entertainment and is distributed by Anchor FM and is available on Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.